introduced Melvin Galicia. He did his master uh, um, in Taiwan about electrical power engineering. Mm -hmm. Then he worked in Guatemala for yeah. in, in Huawei for a while, like three, three years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then he moved to, to Wood to do his PhD in Politechnika Wudska. And he was supervised by Andrzej Napieralski, uh, the, the head of the Polytechnic. And they did, a, I find, a very nice work on optimizing the, uh, the heat flow through the processors depending on how you assemble the cores. Mm -hmm. And today he's going to tell us about that. Thank you, thank you. Hi everyone, um, thank you for having me. Thank you, um, Dr. Nagurski, for having me here. So, as far as I understand, I have 30 to 40 minutes for the yeah. talk. Hope you uh, stay with me during those 30 minutes. 30 minutes. So, the whole idea came about to like, um, about talking today is one of the papers that I had the chance to work back in 2015 about investigation of localized thermal vias uh, to reduce uh, temperature in 3D cores. That was back in 2015. And then this year, like somewhere in, in, at the beginning, uh, I, I read some news about Intel moving there moving to 3D and I was like whoa so the idea is like to make a kind of comparison what we were investigating back then and where the industry is moving today right about uh, uh, microprocessors so I will just go through the agenda of my presentation it will be I'll just facts uh, talk about uh, about myself on the academy side and then I'll introduce the topic background, why we were investigating at that time uh, thermal behavior in microprocessors. And I'll talk about what we analyzed, uh, which processor we analyzed during uh, the, the investigation uh, that we did, and what results we obtained, and okay, so what is the industry using, right? Like, so if we are moving there, so what are, how are they coping with that problem? So, uh, well, as Mr. Sabuski said, my name is Melvin Galicia. Uh, let me start from the bottom. I am from Guatemala. I obtained my uh, bachelor degree back in Guatemala in 2008 in electronics. Then I moved to Taiwan uh, in 2009. Over there, over there, I had the chance to do my uh, master uh, degree, which uh, I obtained in 2011. Uh, afterwards, I uh, moved here to Poland in 2013, and I uh, was doing my PhD studies at the Los University of Technology uh, at the Department of Microelectronics and Computer Science, DMCS. And there, my professor, my supervisor was uh, Professor Anjana Piralski. For today, what I do today, I am uh, a senior software engineer at the, the Research and Development Department of Motorola here at Cerconi Maki. Uh, but we do more uh, development than research, even though the, the name is research and development. Right? So, anyway, so let me let me start the topic about why we were investigating uh, thermal behavior on microprocessors. So the thing is, like, the industry has had this trend since quite a while already, right? Like, getting from bigger to smaller until or size pocket computers, which they are smaller and much more uh, computer uh, uh, powerful, right? So they were, they've been following uh, the so-called Moore's law, which is just more like an observation that Moore's did uh, several years ago that um, the amount of transistors that we can pack in the very same area will be uh, doubling roughly every 1.5 years, two years, right? So that was the observation he did. And since then, well, the industry was following that and they were able to, to go with it. However, already happened something like, let's say three, four years ago, the industry is having troubles to keep that pace. And for example, uh, the uh, ITRS, which is the International 
technology uh, roadmap uh, for semiconductors. Um, they had this horizon of 15 years, and they predicted that by 2022, we we'll, we'll probably will be in the technology of 3 nanometers uh, for the size of the transistors. However, if we look, and we, I was checking which technology are we today, where, what is commercially available, and today, the latest that is available at the market, Intel has is 14 nanometers, uh, and uh, one of the families E9. So let's say to get to three nanometers, they still have to go to, from 14, they have to go to 10 nanometers, after uh, to seven nanometers, uh, five nanometers, and then three nanometers. So it looks like they already having troubles to, to keep with that, right? Uh, but early last year, the Taiwan uh, Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, which is one of the biggest, if not the biggest in the world, that uh, produces semiconductors, they announced that by 2020, they will be in the edge of the technology trying to manufacture 5 nanometers uh, uh, processors, right? But still, it's an announcement. They haven't really moved to them, but they are trying somehow to catch up with. Uh, with uh, why are they trying to do that? Because well, we just wanted more powerful computers and smaller. That's that's where it's been drive this uh, uh, the commercial, and that's what we want. No, that's what we like. So that's where we're moving. However, there's a big problem, and that that wasn't a problem like let's say ten years ago. Uh, that they were moving smaller and more powerful, but then 10 years ago they found out that, okay, if we keep doing, if we keep going that way, we will have overheating. So you just put in more transistor in the very same area, and they are, produ uh, they are uh, consuming more energy, more power. So it's just physics, right? It just translates to uh, heat. So ultimately, the uh, exponential scaling of, of those transistor and power density with the very same uh, size of the uh, silicon will stop the increase in performance. So we will not be getting more powerful computers. Um, so in that time, we say, well, yes, it's very necessary to investigate how to deal with, how to uh, somehow mitigate the problem of thermal behavior, right? Because otherwise, the computer will just burn. If you would try to keep up more of them, they will just not be able to do it. <clears throat> and then also, that at that time, there was something, a topic that was very interesting, and uh, many researchers were uh, moving towards, is 3D. Like, okay, so if we cannot make it like smaller, let's put one on top of the other. So instead of having the same silicon in the same area, we will have the same amount of transistor, but in a volume. That is still good enough. Uh, and why we want to do that? Well, uh, there is one of the problems, the big problems in uh, microprocessors is that velocity. Right? When uh, they, they have a problem with memory access latency, that was the bottle. What does that mean? Like, for example, the core, which is the part of the microprocessor that does the, uh, the computational, right? the add-ups or the multiplications, it has to access the data. In order to do that operation, he has to access the data. And where is the data? Well, they find out that it's several, if not thousand transistors away from where the operation is being performed. So it has to go to the, let's say, L1 cache memory or the L3 cache memory, or the worst case scenario has to go to the RAM memory, right? So it's a long path to get to the uh, information that it has to process. So one of the solutions, well, let's put the memory just on top of it. So instead of going far away on the x direction, let's go one layer up in the, uh, let's say, y direction in this case, set direction, uh, we will get faster. So that's a good idea, and well, it will increase the power of uh, computational power of the microprocessors. That was the big idea about it. So what, was the, what is the main problem? Well, it's still the same, right? So the same problems that a 2D processor has, so we are just making it worse because we are putting one on top of the other. So frequency, active and leaking power of the processor, we just multiply n times. So we, in that, at that time, we were investigating something that we proposed, it was called localized thermal bias, as a promising idea. 
Let me go there. So what is a thermal via? The idea started with something called true silicon vias. True silicon vias is Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, that was his form. So the true silicon vias here is embedded into the uh, silicon. It's not more than a copper bar that goes through the layers of silicon, right? So, but the purpose of them is for electric electrical signaling. So to give to move data between the layers. So we said, why, why, why? We can also use it to help the heat flow towards the heat sink. So that was the idea. And, and say like, well, let's put many of them, as much as we can. The more we can, the faster the heat flow will be from one layer to the next one until it reach, like, let's say, the heat sink or the fan, where the heat will be dissipated. And if that's what's the idea, we was like, well, okay, let's put true silicon uh, thermal vias all over the microprocessor. Uh, but that's not as easy because that could be something like saying, okay, let's, we have already one microprocessor which is working, let's put a lot of holes in, in them and put uh, copper between them, right? But from the uh, uh, semiconductors companies like Intel, they will say no. Why? Because we already have optimized the whole microprocessor. It means we have to redesign everything from scratches, and that's not a good idea. So then we were saying, okay, okay, if we cannot put it anywhere, everywhere, let's put it in very specific places. And we came with the idea of localizing. Let's put it next to the parts where we know the hotspots are, like where the most the heat is produced. Well, this, that was well known, is next to the cores. Next to the cores is where the, the heat is produced the most. So we investigated. What about putting it in those uh, regions? Uh, at that time, uh, one of the most uh, accessible and well-known uh, microprocessor was Haswell i7 uh, from Intel. <laughs> so we said, OK, let's take that one. Let's try to do a very meaningful uh, simulation with that one, what we can do. Let's propose a 3D version of that very same uh, microprocessor. Uh, so at that time, the technology for that microprocessor was 22 nanometers. And from 22 nanometers, the jump in technology node is directly to uh, 14 nanometers. Uh, at that time, the CPU clock rate was uh, 3 gigahertz for that microprocessor. So we decided to do a meaningful simulation of the whole package uh, in, in detailed simulation as much as we could to see what could be uh, the difference of having uh, the thermal uh, distribution in a 2D or in a 3D uh, processor. So in uh, this year, uh, the idea of this presentation came about that because I was reading uh, that in, if I'm not wrong, in February or January this year, at the commercial electronics show in Las Vegas, where it's like many of the big companies present their new innovations. Intel released that this year they will have the very first 3D uh, uh, CPU. So I said, well, yeah, it's true, so it's happening. Back then we were just theorizing, checking how it will be, but now they have it. I have a small, very uh, one minute video that I would like to play for you. How? Yeah, but it's... Ah, okay. So, Okay, so probably will not have sound, but they are presenting how uh, this year, and they will be releasing it this year, how they will be moving towards 3D, and so I was like, okay, so it's happening. We are there already. So I was curious how they were uh, going to implement it, 
and how are they going to manage the term of problem, right? So that's why. And something that is very interesting here is that they moved to 10 nanometers to fabricate this uh, microprocessor. And they were stacking exactly uh, graphics and memory on top of, of, of the whole chip. Uh, so there is a lot of uh, expectation of this because from now on that will be the future, right? So we will be having hopefully more powerful uh, CPUs that they will have access to the RAM layer on top of them. And so that's where Intel is moving and it is driving the whole uh, industry with it. So, and I said, okay, so let me just finish it because it's just when it's finished. Uh, I usually did a presentation of what's the size compared with a pencil and what they're expecting to, 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 prove, to obtain with those. So we know it's more powerful CPUs. So I went back and I started reading, like, okay, so we are moving there. How are they dealing with that? No? So, <clears throat> what, oh, one of the things that I found out that they're, the thermal management they are doing it for, for planning. That's one of the techniques that they use. And if you see here, the, 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 the frequency that they are using is the same as it was in the previous one. 3 gigahertz. And this one they will be using still 3 gigahertz. So something is going on here. That, like with 10 nanometers technology, definitely they could run much more faster. But they are deciding not to because, well, uh, more likely will be the problem with, uh, with uh, heat. So what we were analyzing at that time was a very in-detail uh, uh, microprocessor that we did the floor plan for that one in this case, with the memory we were having there and the cores in this part on the top and quite detailed cores. And the whole methodology that they were using is like we were having uh, three main simulators connected in cascade. One of them, the first one, we were having the statistics of usage. So the amount of instructions that are being performed by a core given one, let's say, one video, one script, one software, right? So how many instructions this CPU will be uh, producing, that was the input for another uh, uh, simulator that was given the amount of instructions, he can tell us how much power will be dissipated in each part of the core, in each uh, part of the microprocessor. Once we know what the power is being dissipated in those part of the microprocessor, we well, can predict what is the temperature that will be uh, produced in that part of the microprocessor, and then we could potentially have the whole uh, uh, thermal uh, uh, distribution of the whole chip. So that's what we did. A bit, a bit on deep. What was the methodology? Is like we were simulating uh, the whole thing, in, of course, in a real uh, CPU, uh, those powerful uh, computers, and we were simulating an AX86 architecture of the microprocessor. On top of that 86 uh, uh, architecture instruction set, we were having a operating system being simulated uh, here, uh, in Linux. On top of that Linux, we were running uh, 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 a, a stress test, a binary. Uh, I remember we were doing something with cryptography. Like the, the software was running cryptography because it demands a lot of the, the CPU, the mathematical area of the, uh, the microprocessor. So we were getting as an output the statistics of the CPU's usage in every part of the microprocessor. So with that, we were putting inside of another simula simulator that is called MacPath. There, we needed to put input the transistor technology. So what is 22 nanometers, 10 nanometers, depending. What frequency was the microprocessor running to? Which voltages it was using? What is was the size of the memories? So put detail in order to obtain what would be the power consumption of each of those units given those access statistics, right? So with that, we move on and did something like uh, use an alert simulator called Hotspot. In here, we have to input what is the size of the heat sink, what are the dimensions, what are the thermal interface materials conductivity, um, 
what is the physical arrangement. So we get more physical, uh, and we could obtain what's the whole uh, distribution of temperature for that given uh, microprocessor that we were simulating. So just uh, mm -hmm. you were. So this is like finite element method or like in this one specifically no because no. we were like with finite element methods it's very time consuming and here we were running okay. several uh, simulations in cascade right so we were so, so the, but, but mm -hmm. there is some heat flow you, you solve some equations correct so we use uh, something like it's called a uh, compact uh, model approach which is um, there is an analogy between heat flow and current. Okay. Right. So instead of solving the full differential equations mm -hmm. uh, on 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 the, the uh, on the whole node each node of the, the the processor, we were solving linear equations for RC doing the analogy. Mm -hmm. That's the analogy that use like heat flow, current. Mm -hmm. So we solve for the, what's the voltage, which will be the drop of uh, temperature, because it's much much faster in in this way. But yeah, in other simulations we were using final element methods. Okay. But in this specifically, we were using the, the compact model. So, so what we obtained, uh, we were analyzing, is, as I said at the beginning, a 2D processors, like as it was, or implementation of this very same 2D processor into a, <coughs> a 3D, mm -hmm. right? And that the idea we came up with about this via region, this thermal bias, what happened if we add this idea of next to the cores, as you can see them, those areas over here do not exist here, right? Those are the ones that we were, that was the idea, adding them. As it was expected, well, just by not adding anything, we just put it one on top of the other, it was overheat. It was uh, much heater than in the normal. So max, maximum, I don't see it. Maximum temperature is around 80? Uh, here we have it. Okay. 70, 70, okay. 71 well, okay. Celsius. Yes, okay. That was in the 2D version. And the, in the 3D version, mm -hmm. 78. Okay. Mm -hmm. And when we added these uh, thermobia regions, we, it found interesting that we kind of dropped back to what was in the 2 version. But now we had it in a 3D version, right? Mm -hmm using the same power, the same consumption. So that was for us very interesting. Uh, we found out, okay, that's, that's good results. And if you would replace uh, copper by gold, which is better, <laughs> what, what, what happens? Definitely the thermal conductivity will uh, be uh, higher, and then the heat flow definitely will go faster towards the, toward the heat sink. Mm -hmm. uh, but that comes another restriction that, in our case, we don't have it, but it's economical <coughs> restrictions, right? and time of manufacturing because gold and copper have different melting temperatures mm -hmm. in order to put them and they pour them inside of oh, those okay. silicon uh, okay. so there are, okay. in my in my investigation that was part of the restriction in my case would be just what is the thermal conductivity mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. but is there no problem with uh, electric current due to the heat difference because it also causes something yeah there are such problems for example uh, those those Cooper bars need to be isolated. They are you just don't put it next to the silicon. Okay. So there are this manufacturing technology that also brings a bit of problems to the manufacturing process, right? Because they have to be isolated. Mm -hmm. So I uh, hear one of the main problems that we found, like it's good for the from the thermal perspective. It seems promising. But as 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 you can see here, uh, uh, on the on the red line, there were no thermal bias, so it was hotter, right? This dashed line represents the the, the the 2D. What was the temperature in 2D when we were? Oh, so the, the the main idea of this one, this chart is like this. So if the thermal bias are good idea, the thermal bias regions are good idea. So let's make it bigger, wider. If they are working, let's make it wider, and probably will get better and better. So we started to check what would be the, uh, the response of the, ma the maximal temperature compared with the width of, of, the, uh, of the VR region. And we found out that, yeah, the bigger the, bigger the, the, the width of the VR region, the lower the temperature, but there's something happening here. You see, there are thermal gradients that are occurring which they represent a problem of reliability. 
Why? Because the, the, ter the, the thermal conductivity and properties of silicon and copper are different. So when it starts coming the problem of pulling it down, heating it, cooling it down, it probably gets some stress inside of the processor expansion, right? So that's also another consideration that needs to be uh, taken if they're going to move there, right? Because that's a reliability problem. So we were... So what, once again, why, why, you, why it's so, you know, mm -hmm. what makes it this, I don't know, this, this length of whatever, like, it seems that there's some characteristic length of like four nanometers, like here, you know, mm -hmm. every... Uh, this one's for yeah, Yes, yeah. For, exa for example, exactly. Yeah. This part over here is the VR region here. Mm -hmm. This part here on top is the core. And then you have, again, another VR region here. Ah, okay. No, so I see that. Yeah. So yeah, that, this, this is that's like, exactly I was thinking a different way on this. Yeah, that's the VR region. So that's where the temperature is dropping, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and, and somehow that also not very uh, wanted because of the reliability problem, right? The stress. So we were, uh, so that's exactly what we were doing, right? Like making it bigger the VR regions, and we decided to plot the maximum temperature against the VR region width. So how it was behaving. And we found out that <laughs> there is a limit to the size that you can really make uh, the width of the VR, uh, VR region. Why? Because there is a, like, at certain point, there's no, there's no, doesn't make sense to keep making it bigger because we are not getting bigger temperature drop. As you can see in this graph, like it looks like at some point it will just get close to what the 2D version is. And it's getting a bit even lower just because we are increasing the total area of the of the whole chip, right? But just increasing about 8%, we almost get 90% of the temperature in the 2, 2D version. So we were like, oh, that's so good. So we know now that there must be an optimal width. Of, 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 of that. So that was quite interesting and we published those results. And the conclusion of that paper was about uh, that localized thermal vias had the advantage of uh, not disrupting whatever they already have. Right? Like if they already have a four plan that is quite optimized, let's say. Uh, they don't have to disrupt the whole thing. They just need to add specific areas where uh, this could help. Uh, to the thermal problem. <clears throat> we also find out that while making it a 2D version of a chip, making it 3D, they just needed to add, well, at least for this specific uh, processor, 8% of area bigger to obtain almost 90% of the same temperature on the 2D version. So that was the draw part, right? You just make it a bit bigger and you will have the almost same temperature as a 2D version. <clears throat> And also we found that the peak temperature decreases exponentially with the VR region width, but at some point it doesn't make sense to keep making it bigger because we will not get more uh, temperature reduction. You know? And we also find out that the temperature gradients uh, increase with the increment of, of the use of thermal vias, which of course will lead to reliability problems on inside of the microprocessor. <clears throat> so I say like, okay, so if we are moving 3D, what, are, what is Intel using? How are they coping with the problem, right? So I start reading, I check in like, how, how are they going to handle this? And I think I give you the spoiler at the beginning was they are using the very same uh, um, frequency on the processor. And they are still using mainly uh, the fan plus the heat sink. They are... Uh, for even for those microprocessors, they will keep using the very same uh, thermal cooling solutions that they've been using for a long while. I will just some uh, desktop PC where the, the gamers mainly they use this uh, close loop liquid cooling solution. Right? They put in top of the heatsink, they put this uh, liquid cooling, but that's not that's just for very specific scenarios. <clears throat> so I was checking, like, okay, so if they are not using it today, probably tomorrow, a few years, when are they going to go with that? So I went to the IRDS, uh, which is the successor of the ITRS, 
is the international roadmap for devices and, and systems on, on the report of the last year. I was unable to find any roadmap for such solution. Where are going to implement it? So they have, still have no no forecast for when they are going to start using uh, true silicon vias, or there when are they going to start like micro channels for me, uh, liquid cooling, but inside of the processor. So it looks like they are just still dragging the problem. They are just keeping it with them. They are just trying to keep control the temperature um, because in 10 nanometers, easily the microprocessor could run at five gigahertz, so faster. But, but the temperature is directly proportional to the frequency in, in those uh, microprocessors. So they are just keeping it, keeping it because they are relying on obtaining more performance just out of shrinking it, make, putting more uh, transistor there, not by making it faster in the clock speed of the microprocessor. So on my personal opinion is that the industry will not move to any sophisticated uh, cooling techniques, not until the cost of cooling will overcome the cost of getting more performance. So in, in that sense, it's like if still is cheap to cool it with a, a fan and a heat sink, or for example, a data center just by putting air conditioner all around, still manageable. This, this, uh, there is money, yes, there is money, but we still getting performance out of it. When this balance will be like, oh, we need to cool it now because we are not getting more performance. So until that moment, they probably will start uh, moving towards uh, more sophisticated uh, 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 cooling cooling systems, right? So those are some reference of those information as I give you just now, uh, where Intel is moving. Uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to. It's already visible, I think, the past few years, like this 2.4 gigahertz and then 3 gigahertz, there is no huge difference, so it's already slowing down, so I think that probably this cooling point, when they start focusing on that, probably comes soon in 20 or something. Uh, but for example, for example, for the 2020, the ITRS still predicts shrinking to uh, 3 nanometers, right? So they still can get performance just by putting more transistor. And what about the power consumption? Because, for example, if I'm using my laptop, I would like to have maximum uh, speed, but mm -hmm. still I would like to decrease the consumption for lower, uh, for longer battery life. So, and, and normally that's a trade-off. That that's, there is no way to to go around with that. No, so uh, they are trying to move to lower consumption, but you cannot get like put games, right? Like you, you have laptops that uh, that are very low consumption, but if you try to put a game on it, you, you, there's a trade-off that. Mm -hmm. the, and everything comes to energy consumption, right, and heat production. Mm -hmm. So what they're, my, my, what I, for what I see is like in 2020, 2022, sorry, if they are able to get to three nanometers, which I don't think so, probably 2025, 2026, they will get for three nanometers. So they still can get performance out of just putting more transistor, mm -hmm. shrinking it. But after that, there is no possibility to keep shrinking the transistor. So and they have to put it one on top of the other, so they really have to, mm -hmm. to from there, they need to, mm -hmm. to find more fancy solutions for, for cooling. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's also the possibility of uh, active, active transport that is considered for this kind of Yeah, there are, for example, those are one of the, uh, let's say, cooling solutions that are being researched now, uh, nowadays, like trying to like do the, reuse of that heat, no? Uh, but um, from the industry perspective, I think they are not ready to move there. Because for example, this one of uh, just putting a bar of Cooper to take the heat out is quite simpler compared with the filter that you mentioned, no? Much more simpler also than the liquid cooling passing inside of the microprocessor. But they are still not moving there. So I guess we are still have to wait a bit more to to to, to see such kind of uh, solutions. But they are being considered. From the top, you can also do sideways, like making a, a layer layer of copper with cut 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 holes. 
maybe it's cheaper just to put, 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 put a layer of copper and cut, cut, cut in the places when it's needed to, to, to take the heat sideways. That, that's one of the things, but uh, the main problem is the one I mentioned there. It's like to access to the data. No? The more separate you have the, the CPU to the access of the, let, let, let's say, the DRAM or L3 cache, the more transistor that you have to hop to in order and go and coming back to get that data. No? And that is a bottleneck in, in performance. So that's why they're trying to put it closer, because the closer it gets to it, the faster it will move, no? the signal and everything. So if they try to spread it out, we'll start getting bigger uh, computers or bigger uh, uh, smartphones. So there is also, that is exactly from the thermal perspective, yes, better to spread it out. But from the, what we want, we want smaller uh, uh, smartphones, but more powerful. So we also dictate, we also have a say on that, no? like where the commercial part is going to. Have you tried different assemblies of the cores? Because you just shown like you know one and the, the copper bars, but have you tried like optimizing for different I don't know rearrangements? Yeah, we course? did uh, during my studies. In this paper specifically, not. In this paper specifically, we follow what was the arrangement that Intel already had. Right. Mm -hmm. So we just wanted to see how to this same uh, arrange will behave in 3D. But during my studies, yeah, we we were arranging. Uh, that, that's called for planning, right? So how do you put the the cores if you put it one next to the other or you just put it very far apart mm -hmm. or you put the L3 memory cache between them in order to check what will be the behavior uh, on different scenarios of, of that. For planning is also, and I guess it's one of the things that Intel have done in this 3D chip that they will do, you know, like check what would be the best way of putting the, the, the layouts of the part of the <coughs> microprocessor in order to obtain a very good uh, thermal uh, behavior. No, yeah. Yeah. Mm, you also showed that uh, these processors are having GPUs now. And my processor also has a GPU, but uh, I, I was actually surprised when I bought that. And I'm just curious, what's the limit? So can you reach the performance of, for example, an NVIDIA um, card or not really so what so, can you, can you so this uh, graphic process uh, graphic uh, chips on, on these uh, processors can they what, what, what is their limit uh, uh, but, uh, so how strong some, they can be so they can of performance you mean or like mm, yes for example I know that for example my computer switches when it, I'm using my desk only the desktop then uh, the processor handles it but if any game or video is played then usually my Nvidia card so mm -hmm. what's the limit of these uh, chips. For example, right now they are uh, not using, like they are not putting in top of each other with GPUs. They are, you have a normal CPU, and what they are putting on top of them is memory RAM. Right? Because exactly, that's what you just mentioned is the big problem, right? Like if you put the CPU and on top of that you put the GPU, so you're putting the two hottest things just next to each other, right? Uh, in, in theory, that would be very nice because then you would have a small uh, computer, right? Very powerful and small. But that's exactly the problem, right? So where are they gonna move? Uh, I don't know. I, I was checking one of the videos from AMD, and they are moving towards putting them like in two different layers. Like you have your CPU here and your GPU here, but not together. Uh, so. In that sense, they are just spreading the heat, no? like putting it apart. But how uh, powerful they can get, I guess, if they really manage to find out a very good solution for the heat problem, uh, they can put it together, right? But that remains to be seen. So, standard the from the top, but if you manage the connection from the sideways, you could also cool from the bottom. It's another solution. I'll, I'll show you something. Let's see if I have here. <coughs> the thing is, like normally, normally uh, you have to have interconnections. Like as you see in here, it's upside down, of course. Here is the heat sink, no? So normally, here is where the heat is flowing to, right? So we could put the fan here, right? And we cool it here. But in this part, we also need to have interco electrical interconnection to the motherboard. But if, if, you, if you do it sideways, 
You mean putting sideways this kind, this kind of connections? Yes, yes. Yes, towers. Yes. Sure. Indeed, indeed, it 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 could somehow help. Uh, but as you can see, also, it also depends of uh, if you spread it like that. Uh, you also need to somehow open holes yeah. between connections of of side. Uh, here. So you need to open holes here, right? And uh, uh, between cores and every the whole four plan of the microprocessors. And that's something that the manufacturer is not so happy to do because all that uh, four plan is already optimized normally. Uh, but but in a normal processor, you don't have pins on a whole surface, but uh, uh, there are arranged uh, as square mm -hmm. belt around. That's for because what we see normally, what we, when we take the microprocessor, when we see it, that's the bed of the of the whole processor. But the processor itself itself is very tiny. It's like the size of our fingerprint, which is already inside. No, so that's where. Normally, what we see is just the pins for interconnection to the motherboard. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, or we, we can have a follow up, <laughs> think, you know, for, for people interested. But uh, yeah, I yeah, I'll be happy that, to, to, to answer. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>